It's a pleasure for me to talk to you about my research on uh, automated air traffic control for non-towered airports. So let's jump into it. Um, my, the goal of my research is to um, investigate methods that would help avoid problems like these. Uh, accidents, uh, mid-air collisions like these happen about once every month in the United States. Uh, and in a scenario like this where it's still a beautiful day outside, uh, these two aircraft still manage to find each other in the air. Um, now, why does this happen a lot to general aviation aircraft? Is It's because of this idea of the big sky theory. Um, and uh, the idea there is that as long as you uh, see and avoid, you should be able to avoid um, the aircraft should be able to avoid each other. But that doesn't work so well uh, once you're close to, to, um, to small airports, so it's not surprising that the majority of accidents uh, happen for the, to these small aircrafts uh, because they still rely on this concept of, of see and avoid while the larger aircrafts have moved to different technologies we'll discuss later. And just to sort of drill the point home here, uh, the research shows that it takes about 10 seconds to uh, detect um, an, another aircraft and to maneuver out of its way, yet with a four second to collision, the visual, um, the target in, in your field of view is still relatively small. So, so again, the, the, my research is motivated by this and, and the goal is to find methods to, to address it. Um, the outline of the talk is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna show you how, uh, uh, sorry, that's distracting. I'm gonna show you, how, uh, I'm gonna talk about previous work and how my research fits into it and then uh, specifically talk about my problem formulation and uh, my contributions, which are effectively twofold. Uh, the, on the first half, it's on the modeling aspect. So I'm gonna show you how I model the aircraft's pattern as these um, uh, using Palm DPs, and some of these words might not mean a lot to you. We'll talk about them in details later. And then the second half is in the decision-making aspect, and I'm gonna make approximations to, um, um, to solve these rather difficult problems. Uh, in an efficient manner. And uh, in conclusion, uh, we'll talk about limitations in the future work. So to, to frame my work in of automating air traffic control, which has been really a decades long endeavor, I'm, I'm gonna show you a little bit of uh, sort of a spectrum on how, how, how this works. Uh, when, a lot of times when people talk, think about air traffic control automation, they think about sort of this big picture view across uh, the United States and, and basically, um, finding optimal trajectories that would avoid weather or that would avoid, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, so that the aircrafts don't all arrive at an airport at the same time. So this is work has been going on since the 80s and uh, some of it has been implemented uh, in, in recently. But at the end, other end of the spectrum, there's sort of this more tactical view of automating air traffic control. And, and the idea here is that uh, you might know that there's a collision that's about to happen. So systems like TCAS allow pilots to avoid each other. Uh, and, and TCAS has been really successful. And um, so, so it's not surprising that a lot of work are trying, uh, a lot of people are trying to bring this technology to general aviation aircrafts. Um, but between these two ends, uh, there's this concept of terminal area uh, air traffic control. And the idea here is rather than wait until you know that aircrafts are about to collide with each other, you can take more of a strategic view. So for example, this is work uh, out of NASA Ames with, from Dr. Elspelka, where if, if you know that there are two aircraft that are trying to land at this runway, rather than wait again until they're about to collide, you can tell one of them to extend its uh, downward leg here, or, or in this case, to extend an upwind and, and avoid collisions. But this work, again, focuses on, I, on large aircrafts and, and instrument flight rules. Um, there, there's some work that's trying to address small airport, airport, airports, but once again, it focuses on instrument flight rules fl fri and IFR flights. Uh, so for example here, the idea was to have an automated system that would clear aircraft from a fixed point into, into a, a landing. So what I'm trying to sort of what I'm trying to have you get out of this, this, this previous work is that while uh, a lot of work on automating air traffic control is being done, uh, the focus is on IFR, with the exception, as I was mentioning here, of, on, the, on this tactical view. So where my work fits in is in this area here, We're trying to have these, uh, uh, to investigate a method that would do terminal area air traffic control, but for non-towered air force, for general aviation aircraft. So the problem formulation is, a, is as follows. That, that we, we envision an automated system that would um, use some sensors and have a centralized view of where the aircraft are. And then using uh, these decision-making tools, we would uplink commands. And, and the idea is that we wouldn't uplink them using a data link, but rather just uh, speech synthesis, so that it just fits in, in the existing framework so that it's a, um, 
uh, over the CTAF, the, the common traffic uh, air frequency. So being a controls guy, I sort of think of these loops. That what we're looking at here is we want to model these aircrafts in the traffic pattern, and then we want to sense them, do this decision making, and uplink these commands. So to telling you exactly where my contribution is here, let me first tell you where my contributions are not. So I'm, I'm not looking at the sensors and how do you actually figure out where these aircrafts are. The reason being that there's a lot of work on that, whether it's ADSP being rolled out, uh, people at MIT and Lincoln Labs are working on this concept of small um, airport sensor systems, et cetera. Uh, likewise, in the uplink system, there's a lot of work on integrating um, autonomous uh, systems in the air traffic control um, area. So this being early investigative work, what we're looking at is how do you actually model the air traffic pattern? So I'm going to show you um, how we model this using the a partially observable Markov decision process, and then how we can learn some of the parameters for these um, structure from the, for these uh, um, models from real world data and then put these in simulations. And then in the second half of the talk, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how we can approximate some of these methods. Um, we can come up with approximate solutions to some of these problems. And specifically, I'm going to talk about three different approximation um, uh, solvers. It's the, an offline solver that, that leverages the structure of the problem and then things that um, improve the scalability of, of the solvers. And also, we're going to look at the partial observability problem. Uh, so these contributions have led to uh, a few papers. The first one was on the initial formulation. The second one was on using continuous time framework for the solving. And the last was on the, well, just submitted, is on the model learning. So let's jump into the actual modeling. So the, the idea here is what we're trying to do is uh, figure out how the aircraft behaves around the pattern. So since we're modeling these aircraft, it's natural to try to start, start by looking at its rigid body states. So if you're familiar with the 12 uh, states, position, velocities, orientation, and um, angular velocities, and then if we had the pilot inputs, we can then take that and put them in nonlinear equations. And uh, given those nonlinear equations, you can then discretize them. And if you account for uncertainty, you can have this probabilistic uh, view of um, the, the problem, mainly that the state of the next time step is distributed with some function that is parameterized by the state of the current time step and by the pilot inputs. So we can take this and put it in what we call the Bayesian network framework and sort of just in a graphical way to see this. And, and the idea here, again, is that the state of the next time step depends on the state of the previous time step. And then we can chain this for, for, pre, for uh, multiple time steps. This is just a small change of notation. But, but as I mentioned, these states and these probabilities are also driven by the pilot inputs. And uh, if you're, the, it's not surprising that you would expect that the pilot inputs would actually depend on the current states, right? So in the classical control sense, that would be some feedback controller. Uh, but not only that, the pilot inputs would also depend on the net, what his what he or she is trying to accomplish, right? So you can think of that as a, uh, a reference trajectory that they're trying to track. So for example, if the pilot is try, trying to fly a downwind or a base, that's going to determine how, he, he, uh, how their inputs are going to uh, be driven. So this is just a, we use here a plate notation for, for compactness. And we can basically chain this uh, again and say the navigation goal is going to determine with the next navigation goal and, and so on. And we can build on this hierarchy uh, more and more. So for example, you can include the intent of the pilot. Is he, are they trying to apply uh, closed traffic or to land on a given runway? Now, a model like these have been proposed in the literature uh, by Lao, Jonathan Howe, and Liao, et cetera. And what I'm doing here is building on them, uh, although I'm using slightly different uh, details in the model, with, with the idea of including actions. So to explain here what, what actions are, uh, if you're familiar with an autopilot, these actions would try to affect the state directly, right? So if you try to damp your debt troll or, or a fugoid, you would have something that tried to control the control surfaces directly. Um, at the higher level, you would have um, things like TCAS, where the goal is to um, affect the pilot input. So TCAS will tell you to climb, climb, um, and that would be where you inject the actions. And what we're looking at are sort of these air traffic control commands that are at even higher levels. So you can think of them as macro actions. We're not trying to control the details of the trajectories, but we're trying to control how the pilot is going to navigate around uh, the airport. So this lends itself well to being modeled in the stochastic optimal control framework, namely Markov decision processes. So some of you might be familiar with this, but just to make sure 
we're all on the same page. Um, the idea is an MDP has this tuple of state action transitions and rewards. And the state at the next time step is, again, determined by the action and the state at the current time step. And then the rewards are um, also a function of the actions and the, and the state at the current time step. But MDPs are really a special case of what we call POM DPs. And in a POM DP, what you have is that these states are not available to your system. And instead, what you have are observations that are distributed uh, with some, again, distribution from the, that state. And, and the goal in both MDPs and, and POM DPs is to optimize these rewards, but with some discount over some, some finite horizon. So the goal is to come up with these optimal policies. So what I'm going to do over the next few slides is talk a little bit more in detail about the state transitions and observations for the, um, uh, my, my problem here. And the actions and rewards and policies are going to be, again, in the, the, second, aspect, the second part of the talk. So the state space, we, what we're going to do is we're going to take this um, hybrid view where we have this mix of continuous and um, discrete states. The continuous states are going to be the rigid body of the aircraft. And if you notice, I'm only using a subset to model this. And, and the idea is that I don't, we don't need the details of the, the flight dynamics. We just want to have a big picture view of where the aircraft is. And then the second part of the state is going to be the navigation goals of the pilot. So these are going to be these discrete navigation goals. For example, I'm using here um, acronyms for them, but le left base or appoint and et cetera. And the transition functions for the rigid body, that's just going to be determined, as I mentioned earlier, by these linearization, but not necessarily linearizations, but, but these nonlinear functions of the dynamic the equations of motion. And then for the, uh, the pilot behavior itself, that's where it gets interesting, and that's we're trying to find probabilities of, given that the pilot is in the upwind, what is the probability that they're going to now f try to fly crosswind or they're going to try to depart. And then the observations, what we're going to assume is that they, they are a subset of the rigid body state. So we can't see all the rigid body states, but we might, we, we're going to have a noisy position of velocity measurements, but we're not going to have a direct measurement of the, what the navigation goals of the uh, pilot are. And just as a sneak peek to sort of complete this view, the actions and rewards, the, the actions are going to try to modify the navigation goal of the pilots, and rewards are simply don't hit other airplanes. So again, going back to this uh, the Bayesian network fr framework, this is just uh, illustrating how that works. But what I want you to sort of realize is that I described how one aircraft behaves, but to model this entire um, pattern, we need to have a um, factored state. So this is the idea here is that we're stacking uh, K aircraft in the pattern, and their, their transitions are uh, um, determined. We're going to talk about them sort of later. Um, so solving for these optimal actions can be difficult, but you can always simulate this. And, and what I've done is taken this and simulated using it, using what we call a nominal um, pattern, just you know, using engineering judgment. We can say aircraft will start a runway, go to an upwind. They might, might extend to an upwind, and there's some probabilities of them turning left or right, and et cetera. And taking this, we can then simulate the aircraft in, in the pattern. And we can keep track of how often uh, they come close to each other and in what we call a near mid collision. Um, now, th this works well, and, and it gives us at least a tool to, to um, uh, try a lot of our algorithms. But we were wondering, can we learn parameters for these patterns from real-world data? So uh, are, are the locations of these, um, how, how do the locations of these, ter the, these um, goals depend on which airport you're flying at? So what we've done is we got data from the FAA with, uh, with f some radar observations. And I'm going to show you two methods on how we learn those parameters. One is the turning points approach, and the other one um, is uh, using Bayesian inference. Uh, but first, let me describe what the data looks like. Uh, I like to say it's sometimes hair in the sink. But there's still some structure in, in, to it. And, and for example, so this is Princeton. You can see that there's some IFR tracks that never descend into the, the airport. But nonetheless, there's some pattern down there. This is a Republic, uh, small towered airports. But there, there are two runway configurations there. Um, so w without talking about the details of how we do this, what we do is we use um, unsupervised uh, uh, clustering methods to figure out what the different configurations are for each uh, airport. So uh, for example, this is the, the top is the dominant runways for, for, for each conf configuration. And here you can see a lot of people making a left turn. Sometimes people do make a right turn. There's a lot of uh, some people coming in in an extended final. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this one. And even though this is a towered airport, the reason is that we, we imagine that the first time you would want to deploy a system like this, you would want to try it at a towered airport. So we want to show that we can, in fact, learn these more complex that are uh, uh, patterns. So the first method to learn this is 
uh, inspired by the work of Gary et al. Um, and, and the idea is that uh, if uh, they did their work on trajectory clustering. And the idea is if we can find uh, turning points for these trajectories, and that gives us uh, a measure of when the pilot has changed their navigation goal. So for example, here this aircraft is uh, departing roughly south and it's turning into a, cross, into a crosswind and then into a downwind base and back into a final. Uh, I'm going to focus on the black line here. If you're curious about the red one, ask me at the end. If we take a derivative of that signal, then we can find where those uh, turning points are. Now, given those turning points, we can take them and cluster them. And we can then go back and take each one of these trajectories and turn it into a sequence of these clusters. And given that sequence, we can then compute probabilities of going from one turning point to another and then get these uh, networks that tell us uh, the probability of going from one navigation goal to another one. So this works well for the nominal, for the nominal um, pattern. And we tried it for the, for the real uh, data that we've learned or rather for the real observations that we have. And, and some of the structure for these patterns that we've assumed we actually observe in, in, in the real data. So for example, there are two different clusters for where the airplanes turn, uh, both in the downwind and, and the upwind. Uh, but this is only focusing on the closed traffic pattern. When we try to include the, all of the pattern, then you have to throw more clusters at it. But eventually, you get a, a, an idea of where these turning points are. But nonetheless, we still are relying on this artificial uh, idea of dif differentiating the heading. And in, in, in these cases, as opposed to the simulated data that we have, the, these, um, the, the heading information tends to be noisy. So what we tried to do is do something that didn't rely on this differentiation and that led us to this Bayesian uh, inference uh, framework. And, and the idea is that the parameters that describe our uh, our model, if we put a prior distribution on them, if we could compute the likelihood of the observation given those parameters, then we can use Bayes' rule, flip it around, and compute the posterior of the parameters given the observations. Now, in reality, except for very special cases, these parameters, um, uh, the, you, you can't really find these uh, in a closed form, so you end up having to resort to numerical methods, uh, whether that's expectation maximization or Markov chain Monte Carlo. And then again, to illustrate this a little bit better, um, what we, this is the same model I had earlier, just sort of more blow, blow, blown out, where we're seeing the, those rigid body states and the relationships. And, and the idea is we have these observations and we're trying to learn how all the relationships are and what those probabilities are. And we, we tried this and sort of led us to this concept of probabilistic programming, which I'm not going to talk about too much. But again, if you want to hear about it, ask me at the end. Um, and, and instead, well, it turned out to be basically too slow. And, and to make the inference more tractable, what we d we've done is the, use this idea of uh, Gaussian hidden semi-Markov models, where we abstract basically these rigid bodies and just put them directly into observations that are parameterized by these Gaussian distributions. And on top of that, we end up using this idea of semi-Markov process, which again, I'll talk about more in details later. But in a nutshell, we're saying now that it doesn't take always the same time to go from the current navigation goal to the next one. Instead, there's a probability distribution on that. And the beauty of this is that you can use these different priors to, to end up with what we call conjugate priors. And you can use more effective um, sampling methods and then make the inference more tractable. Now, when you run these MCMC chains, what you get are, is basically a, a um, a draw from the posterior of the parameters. So for example, here you can see these navigation goals. As the chain converges, the locations don't change as much, but you, you start seeing that the probabilities themselves are changing. Now, qualitatively, this looked better than the turning points, but we wanted to have a more quantitative measure of this. So uh, what, what we've done is taken this, um, We've assumed that both the observed data and the data that we generate from our models are Gaussian mixtures. And, and the idea then is just they're just weighted normals, and um, if we, which describe two probability distribution functions. And the way we then compare how well does our model do compared to the real world data is we can compute these divergences between them. So for example, we can compute a symmetrized KL divergence or a Cauchy-Schwarz divergence. But before we can do that, we have to actually determine what the bandwidth is of these Gaussian mixtures. And to illustrate what that means, if, if you use too small of a bandwidth, then your probability distributions end up being very centered at all your measurements. So any small difference between your model and your observations lead to very large uh, differences in, uh, in, your, in your likelihoods. And likewise, if the bandwidth is too large, then everything is smeared. So that you can't really tell a difference. You can't really tell whether your model is doing well or not. But what we've done, we've used k-fold cross-validations to actually determine what the optimal bandwidth ought to be, and it turned out to be around here 100 um, 
identity matrix. So when we do that and we compute these diverge divergences, then um, we, we see that according to both the K symmetric KL and the Cauchy Schwarz, this HTTP GSMM model uh, does perform better than the turning point method. Um, and the, in, in wide, what we're seeing is sort of within intra-model uh, uh, divergence, meaning that if you used observations from the real data as a proxy for your real data, then that's how, 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 um, how what it looks like. So this finishes the, oh, before, no, I guess it doesn't finish, this finishes it. But uh, in, it, to, to give you, sort of, sh show you a little bit how those models perform, on the right, what you're seeing is draws from these trajectories. And you can see that it captures some of the uh, important uh, structure from, from the, the, the actual data, whereas B, that there's a lot of tracks that converge in the final, and also that we have sort of this uh, departure angle there, and et cetera. So that does finish the uh, modeling aspect. Now we want to go into the decision making. So we know how the aircraft behave, but we want to give actions to pilots so that they can um, not hit each other. Now the problem is that within the PalmDP framework, it's difficult to come up with these optimal actions. And, and the reason is that we, we have these con not only continuous space, but even if you discretize it, very large um, uh, spaces. And, but, and while there are different algorithms that can make approximate solutions to PalmDP, what's interesting here is that you, because we have this concept of macro actions that we can't really control the details of the trajectories, what we can do is abstract um, that, and, and it's like, like we did in the learning, and only model the navigation states, which leads to this idea of a, uh, of a possum DP. And we're going to still use the PalmDP framework for simulation, but that possum DP is going to be used for the, uh, for the uh, decision making. And, and to drive this point home, again, we have this sort of real world that we model as a PalmDP, where we have, again, these uh, hybrid states. And but here, the time is discrete, and we're simulating things at this four hertz um, time scale. And instead, what we're doing is we're abstracting those rigid bodies, and in this decision making, we're only reasoning about the navigation goal of the pilots. And now, we're d dealing with a continuous time with these, um, uh, with frequencies that are, with time constants that are larger. And what that looks like, what it means to sort of be semi-Markov, um, in, a, in a Markov sense, what you have is that the probability of the time to go to the next state is always sort of this Dirac, so it always takes the same time unit. Whereas in a semi-Markov, what you have is a distribution about how long it takes to go to the next state. Um, and it, the, the reason it's called semi-Markov is that the state itself is no longer enough to capture the, 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 the system. Instead, you also need to keep track of, of the time. There's one exception to semi-Markov distributions, and that's exponential time distribution. So if you have an exponential distribution to the time, then they have this beautiful property of being memoryless, where it doesn't matter how long you've spent in the state, it always, the additional delta is always the same. And that's what um, in literature is called the continuous time. And so when you add the decision making, this is where you get this POMDP, POSMDP, or POSCTMDP. So we're going to try to solve these POSMDPs, but the problem is that even POSMDPs are still difficult to solve. Uh, so I'm going to make uh, two more assumptions, and as, as the talk goes on, I'll, I'll show you how we can, we can get rid of those assumptions. But the first one is we're going to restrict ourselves to these exponential time distributions, meaning that we restrict ourselves to Markov systems. And then we're also going to assume that everything is observable, meaning that we're dealing with CTMDPs. So for a CTMDP to define it, what we need is this, this again, tuple, state, state actions, transitions, and rewards. We also need now the soldier in time in each state, which leads to this concept of intensity matrices, as we'll discuss later. Um, so the state space is going to be as before, where it's this factored state with um, all K vehicles uh, stacked together. And uh, we've talked about this a little bit in detail before, but what I haven't talked about are the actions. So, so let me spend a little bit more time on this. Um, the idea is that the actions are going to be these tuples, where the first element of the tuple is which aircraft is the system trying to address. And the second element of the tuple is the navigation goal that we're trying to tell the pilot to, 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 um, to achieve. Now, if, if you notice, really this formulation is a multiple multi-agent multi Markov decision process. And in problems like these, what's commonly done is that the, the planning is going to issue actions to every single vehicle. But we don't want that, right? And in a problem like this, you want the system to only address one aircraft because we expect that we're uplinking these commands using, um, using uh, speech synthesis. Therefore, you don't want to chatter too much on the, fre on the frequency. 
So as an example, if you only had two aircrafts and one was in the right arrival and the other one in an extended upwind, you can either say do nothing or you can tell one aircraft to, sort of, to enter on the 45 or tell one to turn a left base or tell one to turn on a right base. Now to um, the, the transition probabilities, we're going to make this strong assumption, so I'm going to talk a little bit in details here. We're going to assume that the, pilot, the transitions are effectively independent. And, and, and the idea here is that uh, in reality, pilots will sequence themselves, right? They will communicate with each other. And here we're taking a more conservative uh, view of it, that, they're, they're not, that the worst can happen as if they did not actually try to avoid each other. So we'll see that we'll bias our results a little bit, and we'll talk a bit more in details. But th what that leads to is that it's this factor transition probabilities where we, we just have a product of the individual um, transitions for each aircraft. As I mentioned, this is just the transition probabilities, but for the CTMDP, we also need the soldier and times. And the, what, what's, what you can do is use this concept of continuous time Bayesian networks to combine the two in these intensity matrices. Uh, the beauty of these intensity matrices is you can encode both the transition probability and the soldier and time in a single matrix. So the idea is in the diagonal, you store the soldier and time, and then the ratio of the off diagonal to the diagonal tells you the probability of going from one state to another. So this would describe how one aircraft behaves if you gave it a certain action. But what we're interested in is how do all K aircrafts behave. And because of this assumption of independent behavior, we can use Kronecker sums to stack them together. And while I'm not going to go into the details of Kronecker algebra, what, what I want to get out of this is that these matrices are huge. They're, they have about n to, the K, n to the 2K entries. And while they're sparse, you still can't store them. Um, so that's. That's in just the nature of, again, these MDPs being large. And I'm going to talk about some of the details um, of this and how we use the structure of the problem to still make this, to still solve this efficiently. So to finish defining the CTMD, CTMDP, what we need are the rewards. So I um, glossed over them earlier. But the idea is that the reward is going to be this trade-off between both safety and intervention. So uh, there's going to be a cost to where every time the system um, intervenes. And we're also going to assign a cost whenever we think that aircrafts are going to collide with each other. Uh, and just like in an MDP, we're going to, we're going to discount the rewards using an, expo uh, using an exponential with a rate zeta. So this defines the CTMDP. How do we now solve it? Uh, we use dynamic programming. And the idea here is that we use value functions. And if you're familiar with that, the, the idea is that there's a value to being in a certain state, which is just the reward in being in that state, plus some discounts and probabilities of being in the next states. And you, if you just start with some assumption, some, some initialization for the value function, and you just iterate over this over and over again, you eventually converge to an optimum. The problem is that iterating over all those possible states and also figuring out what these entries are can be slow. So one of the first things that, that we did to, to take advantage of the structure of the problem is to realize that there is a sense of anonymity, that th these value functions should be, con should be a, in, um, constant inter permutations, or rather invariant inter permutations, so that if you if you permute um, the the first the states of the two aircraft, they should be have the same value. So that allows us to do these iterations over um, only the combinations as opposed to all possible permutations, and that yields about a k factorial saving. That might, for four aircraft, it's about 24, which might not sound a lot, but it's the difference of making sure the algorithm algorithm only runs in an hour versus taking a whole day. Uh, the other thing that we do is to realize that in order to compute this dot product, we, need, we only need one row at a time of these matrices. And um, you can make sure that these matrices have a special structure by, taking, uh, by leveraging the fact that the actions have this special uh, structure. Namely, you can make sure that this tail is always the chronic or sum of the same matrix. And again, I'm not going to jump into the details of that. But the idea then is that we can compute these dot products very fast and um, not require a lot of storage to do them. So uh, we ran this, and it didn't work as well as I had hoped. Uh, so uh, sort of explaining a little bit here we're looking at, on the vertical axis are simulations for the number of nmax in these uh, patterns. And on the uh, horizontal axis is the rate of advisories that we're issuing. And you can see as we issue more and more advisories, that, that reduces. But it sort of plateaus at, a sim at some point. Um, I'm going to discuss why that is. But first, let me talk about how like this is, you know, you might look at this and think that this is a large number, but you should realize that that is for two reasons. The first is that we're simulating four aircrafts flying day and night at a single airport 
all the time and they're never, and the second part is that they're not communicating with each other, right? So this is again a very conservative view of that. Um, now, why does that not do as well? Remember that we, we have these distributions. This is an example of the time distributions it takes to fly the crosswind, and we're approximating it with these exponential distributions. These distributions both have the same mean, but it's clearly not a very good approximation. So to make this better, uh, what we do is we use this, the concept of um, phase type distributions. And, and in a phase type distribution, what we do is we include these fictitious phases for each state. And you can think that there's somewhat of a duality now between these phases that are fictitious and sort of those rigid body states that we abstracted away. So we're, we're bringing them back, but in a more um, still abstracted manner. And, and this has a strong mathematical sort of, um, a strong mathematical um, foundation. But the, and that allows us then to approximate these uh, distributions better. So as, again, each, each one of these nodes, each one of these phases is an exponential node, but as you, as you um, build these networks, you can approximate the target distribution better. Now the problem is that as you include more and more phases, your state space grows. Um, so that, to the point that with five or six phases, we're talking about billions of states. And Luckily, because of all those, all of those tricks that we have talked about earlier, we can solve problems that have um, almost a billion in just two and a half hours. And, and this is on my laptop. And the idea here is that th this is just the time to come up with the optimal policy, but then executing the optimal policy is a simple lookup, so it's quasi-instantaneous. So what we actually do use these uh, policies with more phases, we see that they do perform better. So as you inc include more phases, then um, you, you can issue more rates and, and, and reduce that number of NMAX. And with six phases, we almost rid got rid of all of them. Um, now, to, to go back to, again to this point, because it, it came up in a few times, we, what we've done is looked at uh, different ways of simulating this. So rather than having four aircrafts all the time in, in the pattern, what if we had airplanes that departed and, and, and came, and et cetera? So n not surprisingly, when you do that, that the, the number of NMAX, the baseline, does come down. But nonetheless, our, our system still has the same behavior. We have these Pareto fronts that as we issue more and more alerts, uh, reduce numbers. And, and you know, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, I guess, towered airports or not, but what, one and a half uh, alert or basically communication per minute is not a lot. I don't have any statistical uh, measure of that, but I listen to Palo Alto Tower and, you know, if you have a few aircraft in, in the pattern that, that's on the, the same order of magnitude. So to, to sort of look at how this, where these collisions occur, Without any um, air traffic, con without any of these advisories, uh, it's interesting to find that we find that a lot of the collisions occur in the final. And, and this is actually consistent with um, uh, statistics from the literature that the majority, and it's not surprising either, the, that's the conversion leg. Um, but as we start issuing more, um, uh, as we start issuing advisories, first notice the scale is different. Uh, a lot of the collisions here are, are um, so are estimated to be in the upwind. I'm not going to explain why that is, but again, if you're curious about that, ask me at the end. So if you've noticed, this is from the nominal pattern. I haven't shown results yet from the patterns that we've learned. And, and the reason is that um, it still is difficult to scale these algorithms to these uh, larger models that we learned. And while you could try to either parallelize or you can try to um, uh, run it just for weeks. We, we wanted to see if there's a better way to scale this. And, and this basically led us to, to consider a receding horizon framework. So if you're familiar with model predictive control, that's the same idea. And what we want to do is rather than solve for the optimum policies in all possible states, we just want to focus on the policies from uh, the, the current state that we're in. Now, MPC has been successful because a lot of times you can take these problems and convexify them, um, or at least or they might be con con convex to start with. But in our case, that doesn't quite work. If you, if you actually put this problem as, a, as an optimization, it turns out to be a mixed integer linear program. And on top of that, th there's a lot of stochasticity in the problem, which cannot be neglected. So what that led us to do is to use uh, Monte Carlo tree search. And uh, to give you a little bit of a background in, in MCTS, it, it's been, it's, it sort of came to fame uh, a few years ago in, in Go. And if, you're, if you heard the news just like last month, uh, right, there was this AI that beat uh, the world champion in Go. And while a lot of the hype has been on the fact they use these neural networks, if you actually look at the title of the paper, the other thing to use is RD's tree search. 
And, and the key insight between Monte Carlo Tree Search is that um, it takes this reinforcement learning framework uh, approach to, to the problem where even though we know what everything, uh, how, where all the probabilities are, we're going to just use a generative model and we're going to try to estimate uh, what we call Q values. Just don't be confused, this is not the same Q as the Q we talked about later and that hopefully this slide will make it more clear. Just walk quickly about how MCTS works. The idea is you start in some state, and if you have some estimate of the value of taking action one or action two, say that this value was larger, you simulate what would happen if you took action two. If your simulation told you that you end up in state two, then what you do is you just do what you call a rollout, and this is sort of where the Monte Carlo aspect comes in. You're just simulating, and then you get using some fixed policy, and then you get an estimate of the value in being in that state. Now you can take that back and update your estimate, and say action two was still better, then you take state three, and then you again simulate. But if this time this turned out to be a very, very bad thing to do, then you go back up and say, okay, maybe I shouldn't take action two. Let me see what happens if I take action one. If I do that and end up in state two, what Monte Carlo Tree Search does is you now build uh, the tree better, right? And you start, rather than just simulating, you actually dig into the tree and you say, well, let me see the details of what happens if I took action one or action two. And then you just keep growing this tree as you go. And then once you have enough confidence in your estimate or you run out of time, hopefully I'm not out of time, uh, you can then go and say, return which one is better. Now this is what we call vanilla Monte Carlo tree search. And what I've done is I adapted it to my problem, namely that we have these uh, continuous time sojourns. We also have this uh, coupled, uh, sorry, these factored states. And this allows us to scale the problem much, much better. It, it, but it works so well, I mean, it works so well to the point that you can actually start including the continuous variables in there, namely the time. So the time can now become part of the state. And that allows us to then solve uh, the semi-Markov problem without having to rely on these phase type distribution. Um, and uh, I guess the, the, there's previous work on this, uh, but the, I, I think it's something, sorry. Uh, so the, the idea here is that we can we use sparse sampling where we, we, we grow this tree in, um, by, by having different states that actually capture the sojourn time. And when we run these simulations, we can see that, for example, um, we can now run problems that have up to eight phases, which have not only like, more, like hundreds of billions in the state, and they perform as well as the offline policy. Uh, and on top of that, like as I mentioned, we can solve the SNDP directly, and once again, it works, uh, it does as well as the offline. Uh, the, the advantage of this, however, is that now we can come up with these optimal solutions, uh, or not optimal solutions, but with good solutions uh, in only five seconds, and online, and while five, five seconds is a long time for a lot of system, for this system it's, uh, it's fast enough. And because now we can solve these larger problems, we can go and apply this to the plot problems of, the, to the, for example, the Republic air, Airport, and we can again see a similar behavior that as we issue more and more advisory rates, we reduce the number of NBACs. And to show you how, again, these collisions sort of occur, this is, this is that the runway is here, the aircraft are coming here in final, and without our, our advisories, we see that a lot of the collisions occur in the final, but then as we start issuing advisories, a lot of that goes away, and the majority of them happen in the upwind. So to sort of give you a little bit of an overview of what we've done, I'm not done yet, but to place you where we are here, um, we made two simplifying assumptions to solve the POS MDP. One of them was this exponential sojourn times, which uh, I showed you how we can address that by, by, by using online, pro online methods. Um, and the other one was full observability. But instead now, we have to sort of think, how would you come up with these optimal actions uh, directly from beliefs, meaning from estimating these hidden states? Uh, but the, the problem, though, is that these hidden states are really hidden. And what I mean by that is that we have no measurements of them, not even nosy measurements. And to illustrate again what we're trying to do, we have observations here. And from these observations, we're trying to infer what is this, the, this navigation goals. Um, if you think about estimation, the first things that come to mind usually are common filters, extended common filters. A lot of these things here are nonlinear, but on top of that, a lot of things are um, discrete. So both common and extended common filters don't do as well. Then you could try particle filters, but the problem with that is you end up having to use a lot of particles just to estimate some of the things here that are easy to estimate that don't really need particle filters. So this leads to this concept of Raoult Blackwellized particle filters, where what we do is we abstract, we, we linearize um, some of these, uh, the nonlinear nonlinearities here. Now we have a linear Gaussian system. And what we can do is when we're doing, we're running the common filter for that system, we can compute the innovation 
uh, for our, uh, from our measurements, and we can use that as a weight for our particles. And this allows us then to, to have this, uh, t t this allows us to estimate these uh, hidden states. Uh, and if you're, you, you, this might remind you of other concepts. It's a, Ryobrakulized particle filters are known in the literature also as interacting multiple models or Gaussian particle filters or continuous sound particle filters. So to, to illustrate how that works, so for example here we have an aircraft and these are the measurements that we were getting from it. And let's focus on the bottom here. What we're seeing on the top is, is the truth. So the aircraft here, the pilot has decided that they're, gonna, that they're gonna extend their upwind, but our filter in this case is still thinks that they're in the upwind and maybe in, in, in turning right. But as we uh, sample from these particles, some of the particles are going to start saying, well, the, air, the pilot should be turning left or should be turning right. And only s the ones that are consistent with the measurement that we're seeing are going to have large enough of a weight. So when we sample, we're gonna, the, the belief is going to start converging towards, towards the truth. Um, and again, as you get to the next one of these next nodal points, the filter will think that your um, some of the particles are, are going to diverge, but as we resample them, the, the, the belief starts tracking the truth again. Um, so we can, this describes how we can get the belief for a single aircraft, but then we need, what we really need is the belief for all the aircraft. And, and once again, we can use cron -core algebra and um, stack them together to get this joint belief. And now how do we go from this joint belief to the actions? There's two things we can do. One of them is sort of similar to, again, what you would do in classical control, where you separate estimation from control, and you just take the mean of your estimate as a true state, meaning that you just put it directly on, in the Q values that you've compu computed from a fully observable policy. So that would be one of the ways. The other way is to use what we call QMDP, meaning that you weight some of these actions, some of these uh, Q values based on the belief that they're in a given state. Uh, we expected QMDP to do well here, and, and the reason is that this problem doesn't have any uh, information-seeking actions, which is what sometimes make POMDPs hard. But nonetheless, what, what makes it hard in this case is that our actions don't really generalize to all possible states. So the action, um, the action that you can take in a certain state, you can't necessarily take it in all states. So not estimating the wrong state has a very uh, large cost, which is why, we, the low, as we're going to see, the performance is not as good as we, we had hoped. Um, so, so here I'm showing three different uh, policies for the nominal airport, all uh, partially observable policies. And once again, we see a similar behavior that as we increase the advisory rate, the rate of Nmax is reduced, but all three, um, you could say that one does better than the other, well, one does better than the other, but they also underperform the, um, um, the full observability policy. Likewise, if you uh, run this on the KFRG airport, uh, the Republic airport, uh, again, we see that there's some reduction in the, perf in, in the number of NBAX, but once again, the uh, full observability um, still outperforms the partial observability. And this, uh, the, the problem, again, is that the estimation um, is, is difficult because of the distance between the observations that we have and the, 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 the states that we're trying to infer. So this leads me to my conclusion. Um, and uh, my, my to, to summarize my contributions, um, what, what I've done is I've formulated an automated air traffic control system uh, for non-towered airports and investigated how we can learn the transition model for, for these, um, for these um, uh, models from, from real world data and then implemented, implemented 3D simulations uh, to evaluate some of the policies and specifically approximated the problem as a POSMDP and then used three different um, methods. One was uh, simplifying the problem and only uh, focusing on exponential time distributions. The other one was uh, using online methods uh, to actually solve the semi-Markov. And finally, investigated how you would use uh, both estimation and combine it with QMDP to, to deal with a partial observability. And then in, in simulations, we do see that these policies can reduce the risk of mid-air collisions, but policies are still unfortunately limited by the partial observability, uh, which leads me to my future work. I, I think the belief estimation is something that could be um, uh, improved, but not only only that, you could also work on uh, look at different um, uh, different observability partial observability algorithms. So only only assume that we solve for these Q values directly from um, from in an MDP and then and use QMDP. But there's algorithms like POMCP or SARSOP that could do that. 
Um, the other thing that would be interesting to investigate is graph isomorphism. I don't know if, if something that some of you might have realized, but uh, the, the idea here is that we, we're modeling the pattern and um, where the commands that we issue are tied to that model. And we're making the assumption that the pilot is aware of the same model. Whereas in reality, when you go and actually uplink those commands, there's going to have to be some, some translation layer that makes these commands actionable. So I think that's actually probably one of the most interesting things to take this work next to. Um, and then the other thing would be to look at different actions. So one of the, this formulation allows you to, to model that, but I, I didn't look at that. What, one of the things that, that air traffic controls will do is to try to change how long is a pilot taking to fly one of their legs. And for example, they would ask you to do S turns or do, do holds. So those would be interesting to, to see if they can indeed uh, lower um, the risk again of collisions. And finally, uh, inverse reinforcement learning would be something to uh, investigate. And the idea here is that if you could give an expert uh, a scenario and see what they would do in that scenario, then could you take that and put it back into your optimization and figure out what is the reward, what, is the, what were they trying to do and actually figure out what the optimal actions ought to be.